Disc 7. He leans back, says, Unofficially, of course. We know you were doing your damnedest to help a colleague, and that's what's stopping me from suspending you. I had to make a snap decision, sir. I saw Brandon Latimer with Jasmine Cash, Golding's partner. Ex-partner, according to my intelligence, says the commissioner, exhaling loudly and leaning forward. You need to take your medicine, young lady, do you understand? It's Pulford's medicine that Chancellor's worried about, ma'am, says Staff. We encourage loyalty, don't we? The commissioner says, There is a greater good here, Detective Inspector. Somebody has to tend to that. Staff seethes. His heart beats time and a half, and he tries to swallow his words away, but he can't. It wouldn't do to have another summer eleven, ma'am. Indeed. Jadis Goley might be a black man and a dead man, but he is not a martyr, says Staff. Out, says Pennington. Staff stands, says to the Commissioner, I'm sorry, ma'am. If I'd known the truth was to be buried here this morning, I would have stayed away. Watch your tongue, Wagstaff, says Pennington. Oh, I'm watching my tongue, sir, and I'm sure you're watching it too. The two men glare at each other. Sit down, Wagstaff, says the Commissioner, setting her beady look on staff. You will hear your Chief Inspector out. Pennington says, We know there's going to be activity on the streets as soon as the trial starts. It'll be precipitated by a group of anarchists, then sustained by the local gangs. We have to control this. We all know the full cost of Summer Eleven, as you call it. Commissioner Strong says, We won't be having any more nights where smoke fills our skies. Pennington continues, If this does get out of hand, D.S. Pulford's cause will be irreparably damaged. You make it sound as though he's a pawn, says Josie. This is chess, Chancellor, and we will win with our minds, says Beverly Strong. But Pulford needs evidence, says Staff. The evidence is all in, says Pennington. Your association with that investigation is absolutely over. Have faith in the long game, Inspector, says Strong. It's not a game for me, though I appreciate there is a bigger picture. There's too much blood flowing to his head now, and the words trip out. You go along Holborn, through the inns of court, up Fleet Street, past all the bloody lawyers and the journalists, you get to the biggest trough of them all. Bloody Parliament. Well, I haven't got my snout in that trough. My job remains the same. My calling remains the same. He breathes deep, and Pennington glares at him. Commissioner Strong swivels on her seat, left and right in small arcs. She lets the silence gather. Eventually, the Commissioner says, I've been following the Carmelo Trapani case, Inspector. It's the sort of thing I would have loved to get my teeth into when I was a D.I. The sun just blew his ear half away, ma'am, says Josie. We were there until late last night, and we got a new lead. You have a suspect? We have more than one, says Staff. But D.I. Rimmer made an arrest. The sun says Pennington. You need to overcome your doubts and get a conviction here. Beverly Strong says, Don't let us stop you. She stands, drawing the meeting to its end. I prefer not to jump the gun in the pursuit of truth, says Staff. As he leaves, he sees how upset Josie is, and once the door is closed and they make their way down the back stairs, he turns, holds her, whispering into her hair that everything is going to be all right. They stand there, by the window that looks down on Cloth Fair, until a footfall approaches. He says, 
I have to call on Curtis Considine. You can't go down that road. No, you can't go down that road. The footfall comes close, passing them. She stands on tiptoes, whispers, Don't put yourself at risk. And she kisses him on the cheek. Longer than a friend. Staff jumps on the bus that would take him home. It carries him along, twelve feet above the madness on High Hoban, and heading for Piccadilly, then Knightsbridge and Gloucester Road beyond. But as soon as he sees the ornate towers and spires of Lincoln's Inn, he hops off the bus and strolls across the green, which is pale black in the night. He looks up at Curtis Considine's student digs. If Staff had travelled this far in the other direction, east, not west, he would be on the lime kiln by now. But far more than one world and half an hour separates the two Considine brothers. He shows his warrant card to the GA in an office in the lobby of Curtis's residence, and is told that Curtis Considine and his girlfriend left the building a while ago. He tells the GA that he has to have a look around Curtis's room, and the GA shrugs, watching football on the tiny TV on a shelf in his office. Staff can smell skunk on the man, and he thinks it must be the perfect job for someone. The GA reaches across his desk and pulls a key from a hook. He breathes heavily from the effort and hands the key to Staff. On the stairs, he passes a happy gang of boys and girls, glowing with the carefree glaze of pre-drinks. This is a country mile from the land of guns. The official version of the gun that killed Jadis, with Josie's and Pulford's prints on, is that it was found wedged in a hawthorn bush on the towpath about fifty yards from the cycle calf. A dog walker handed it in to the nick in Dalston, said his setter had found it in the bush. That's shit and you know it, Stafford said to Pennington. The E-gang planted it. He knows every inch of that towpath was scoured, from Kingsland Road to Shepherdess Walk. If Pulford shot Jadis Golding, there is no way that gun could have ended up being put in the hands of the CPS. Staff lets himself into Curtis's room. He can't turn the place over, or even be seen to be going through Curtis's things, because he shouldn't even be here. So he has a surface rummage, sees that Curtis has the latest iPad and an old phone with no battery on his desk. Staff makes himself comfortable in the only chair and reaches for the iPad, which opens to Curtis's Facebook. With one eye on the door, Staff navigates as best he can through the collage of Curtis's social network. This isn't what he came here to do. He wants an actual conversation. There seems nothing untoward, and absolutely no sign of contact from Louis in recent messages. He browses Curtis's photos, reel after reel of drunken youths leering into camera, most often in bars and clubs. Some of them have names against the images. Curtis has 1,746 photos in his gallery. Staff isn't sure he has taken this many photos in his life. He scrolls through quickly, looking for anything different, and finds some photos of Curtis and the Japanese girl from the other day, Mako. There are some pictures of the two of them at a seaside. It looks like Whitstable. Another has them outside an old house which Staff thinks is Dickens' home. And there's one of them with Louis, outside the Naval College at Greenwich. Louis looks different, as if made for this better world, not the life he was given. He isn't wearing his baseball cap, and he isn't trying to look hard. He's laughing, and Mako and Curtis have their arms around him. Staff rubs his eyes, and he feels tired. Can you be made for one world and given a life that takes place in another? And who took the photograph? He moves quickly onto the next picture, and the next, where Mako is making horns with her fingers over Louis's head. In the next, they're more formal, 
just Louis and Curtis and Mako standing up straight, not smiling so much, with another girl, thinner and paper white. She looks vacant, and according to the tagging, she is Layla F. Staff recognises the name from the statements that were taken. Layla Franklin gave Louis his alibi. He goes faster through the photos, and after a few dozen, he gets what he wants. An interior. Curtis and Louis are in a nasty flat with no furniture and pizza boxes, and their eyes are gone. Louis has his baseball cap on, and there is no Mako. It's a different day, different clothes. But through the window, staff can see they are way above the Isle of Dogs. He knows exactly where this must have been taken. So he calls John, and as he waits, his tiredness percolates through the muscles in his legs, up through his sides and shoulders. He gives John Bohr the name Franklin and the place. Balfron Tower. It has been forbidden, but he must take Curtis there with him. Jombo hangs up, and the tiredness washes back down his body, and up again in slow waves, tugging the last pockets of energy down and down into the undertow. Thirty-three. Staff sleep fractures, and though he tries to fight it, feeling so hopelessly tired and with his muscles turned to sap, the sound of the key in the door won't go away. He hasn't a clue where he is. It could be the guest room in his flat, but the window is too small. What the fuck? says a male. He is young and impossibly lithe. His hair is lustrous and pre-Raphaelite. Is that him, the policeman? says a female, passing her hand through the arm of the young male, taking refuge behind him. Staff blinks, sits up in the chair, says, Hello, Curtis. The GA let me in. He takes out his phone, reads a new text from John. It determines his next move. You're not allowed to be anywhere near me. Staff wonders how Curtis would know that. I'm here to make sure everything works out for Louis. Louis is going to be fine. I'm looking after him. You have a plan, don't you? Curtis has two towers of reading material under the window. One stack of books on econometrics, probability, and the history of stock markets. And another stack of published accounts of FTSE and Dow companies. You seem to be ahead of the syllabus, says Staff. Part of your plan? Oh, you didn't tell me you have a plan, Kurt, says Mako. We spoke to your tutors. They say they've never seen the like in a freshman. Curtis puts an arm around Mako, but she shrugs him away. He says, You better go. John Bohr's text tells staff that they've been down to the Balfron Tower and removed Layla Franklin from her sister's flat. They left Louis there as per staff's instructions, and he's okay medically, but he is out of it on a downer. There is an officer on the door. Staff calls John Bohr, says, Make sure they detain the girl. Detain which girl? says Curtis. I'll be right down to see Louis. What's happened? says Curtis. Rimmer's snooping will, says John Ball. Make sure it's Josie who questions the girl. You should concern yourself with Rimmer. I want to see Louis, says Curtis. Thanks, John, says Staff, hanging up. He turns to Curtis, says, Come on then. That's what I came for. See? We all want the same thing. Josie sits opposite scrawny Layla Franklin, whose hair is greasy and flat to her head. She smells of sweat and smoke, but she has big, pretty eyes. 
She introduces Layla to the duty solicitor and tells her she can call her own brief if she wants. Layla holds herself by her own bony shoulders and says, Fucking get on with it. I ain't done nothing. She scratches her neck. I just need to speak to Curtis. Considine? She nods. You mean Louis? No, I don't. I need a drink, man. I need some coke. Full fat. I need some fucking sugar. The duty solicitor tells Josie that Layla must be allowed fluids. Absolutely, we're doing this one by the book. No wriggling off the hook, Layla. I'm not on no fucking hook. I just need a little something. That stuff will kill you and we have to protect you. So as long as you're in our care, you won't be poisoning your body. Josie reaches out and touches her hand. You know what I'm saying? Layla looks up. You bitch! You can't keep me in here and not let me have anything. You don't get better without a little suffering. They're very good up in Holloway. I told you, I ain't fucking done nothing. We found plenty, Layla. It's not just possession this time. And there were weapons on the premises. They can't put me away, says Layla to her solicitor. The solicitor refers to her file, says softly, I'm afraid you have eight months unspent on your suspended sentence. We need to remember that. I'll try for bail, don't you worry. Bail? You're here to stay, Layla, unless you do yourself a favour, says Josie. I want to see Curtis! You mean Louis? She looks confused. Rubs her temples with the fat pads of her wrists. This is fucked up! That alibi you gave us for Louis was fucked up, wasn't it, Layla? Alibi? You said he was with you when Jada's Golding was shot. Curtis? Curtis was with me for sure. We was... We was... Not Louis. It was Curtis! You weren't with Louis Considine. Layla shakes her head and her eyebrows pinch. We was drinking brandy at the seaside. I swear to God, that's what we done. All day. All the time when Jadis was shot, I swear. You weren't with Louis Considine. She shakes her head. Into the tape, Josie says, Layla Franklin shakes her head. Will you swear to that, Layla? Will you let me go? We should discuss this, Layla, says the duty solicitor. We will take into account Miss Franklin's cooperation, says Josie. Full accounts, I promise you. That's on tape, Layla, says the duty solicitor. I was with Curtis. Josie leans forward presses the intercom and asks for a WPC to be brought in to take Layla's new statement about the Jada's Golding shooting and to chase up that coke and to get some Haribo. She crosses paths with the WPC on her way out, says she's going to erase Louis Considine's alibi for the Golding murder. Make sure it stands up. Make sure he hasn't got a bastard leg to stand on. Josie stops by the tall window on the back stairwell. Watches Dawn coming up slow over St. Paul's. She recalls the first time she ever met Louis, how she liked him straight off. She could see he was a good boy, so young. They sure can fit a lot of shit into fifteen years these days. She makes the call, says, It's good news, staff, the best. She's changed her statement. Not everyone's going to see this as a good thing. They'll be looking at how you've gone about this. Was she with Louis when Golding was shot? Swears blind she was with the brother. Curtis, says Star. Curtis 
Here's his own name. Looks as if the hand of something bad has come down hard as hell on his narrow shoulders. They're outside the Balfron Tower, where Layla Franklin's sister has a flat. Layla's sister is doing a little stretch in Holloway, was only too pleased to let Layla have a key, in exchange for a little something. Staff says, Layla Franklin was with you on the day of Jada's Golding's murder. She's a fuck up, that girl, says Curtis. Staff hangs up, pushing open the broken main door to the block of flats, listening to Curtis dragging his feet behind. He wishes he didn't have to do this. Frank Rimmer put a call into staff but got no response. He could have tried harder, but he knows what staff will be up to, out of his sense of loyalty. A shame he knows nothing about chain of command. If Pulford had stuck to what he learned at Hendon, they wouldn't be in that boat. Had staff picked up, Frank would have told him where he was. He really would. But he didn't have to. So he waits for the nurse to bring Esther Myers and reruns all the conversations he's had with Pennington in the last two weeks. He can read the signals. Cuts are being made, and if it comes down to him or staff, he has to do what he can to get ahead. If he can get just the last bit of evidence against Attilio, that could make all the difference. And he credits staff with the flair he can show. His idea that the abduction of Carmelo Trapani has its roots in the past, is totally plausible now, especially with what he knows of A.B. Meyer's brother David, which completes Frank's theory as to how Attilio stacks up in that Russian doll. The television blares its morning nonsense to three residents of the Nazareth House nursing home, who stare blankly through the open French windows and onto the lawns, where the early sun is drying the dew. Thin wafers of vapour rise from the ground, like truth coming out from beneath, muses Frank. This is Esther, says the nurse, as a woman in a wheelchair pushes her joystick and whizzes across the carpet, stopping abruptly just inches from the shiny toes of his perfectly polished shoes. Not inside, Esther. Oh, go to hell, says Esther. She is wearing a turquoise turban. Jade birds of paradise flutter in the print of her dress from the breeze through the French windows. She gives Rimmer the once-over. You police? Detective Inspector Frank Rimmer. A pleasure. You look like police, and you've never done me any good, no how. Calm down, Esther, says the nurse, leaving. I'm damn sure A.B. doesn't know you're here. He'd stop you in your tracks, and that's no mistake. Esther looks away across the lawn. She seems to doubt what she's just said. I don't mean that, of course. You have to be careful with what I say. I'm crazy, you know. Tell me about A.B., Esther. You've been here a long time, haven't you? Does he know where you are? I won't tell you a darn thing so you can go to hell. You don't mean that, says Frank, taking a seat, looking her in the eyes and watching them flit. To the TV, and back out across the lawn. Don't I? Some days I'm not sure what I mean. You know Carmelo is missing, don't you? Do I? We're trying to find him, and A.B. has helped all he can, but we seem to have strayed off track. Strayed off track? Looking into Carmelo's past, that's all. Those days of the races and the trips abroad, and the Battle of Cable Street, Frank smiles. You remember those days, with A.B. and Carmelo, and David? There's no David. A.B.'s big brother. It was just before you and A.B. got married, wasn't it? Esther is flustered. I don't know a David. He was ever such a handsome fellow, 
says Rimmer, sensing a sadness in Esther. Cut down with all his life ahead. They butchered him good and proper. Be quiet! Esther looks out to the lawn and keeps her eyes on the grass. You were fond of David. Was I? Esther Myers leans forward in her chair, peering into Rimmer's eyes with all the unbridled curiosity of the mad. I am crazy. You know what they did to David Myers. Rimmer leans forward and whispers into Esther's ear, smelling Lily of the Valley. His mother used to wear it. His father bought it for her every Christmas, and if she missed a day, he asked why. You know, and I know you know. You're mad, too, you fool. Don't you know that? I know David Myers was cut to ribbons on Brighton Racecourse, and they never caught the man. They never really tried, because it was one villain against another, and everyone assumed it was Charles Sabini, but they couldn't prove it. And the same day, Maurizio Vedetti copped it on Cable Street, whilst the city raged at itself. You got a turn of phrase, mister. It's an amazing story, Esther, and it's got you at its centre. It's your story, Esther. Maybe it's you should be in here. For my own good. Your own good? Like you. Was that the deal? Rimmer stands up. Come on, Esther. Let's take a look at your room. No! Rimmer leaves the room. Here's Esther Myers whirring up behind him, and she clatters into the backs of his legs. He falls, and the nurse comes rushing up, but Frank says, It's all right. He stands, putting his hands on the arms of Esther's vehicle, and unhitches the leads from the battery to the motor. Esther has a suite of rooms overlooking the lawns with a widescreen TV and a beautiful walnut writing desk, upon which sits an electronic typewriter with a ream of paper beside it. On the bookcase... Two entire shelves are taken up by the novels of Esther Samuels. Rimmer counts thirty-eight volumes. Esther appears in the doorway, pushed by the nurse. Rimmer says, I see you've stayed with the same publisher. Loyalty counts for a lot. I just like Esther Samuels. We share a name. You've had a rich life, hey, Esther. Frank taps his temple with his index finger. But all up here. He goes to the coffee table, leafs through the copies of The Spectator and The New Statesman, or the broadsheets from the weekend. I suppose a writer can travel anywhere, any time. Maurice Green is a writer, so they say. I don't know any Morris Green. He's missing too? He would have been born whilst you were in here. Didn't Aby ever tell you about Morris? You'd get along like a house on fire, I'm sure. Esther looks sad. She says, That's a cliché. I wouldn't get along with anybody like a cliché. Perhaps you knew his father. Claudio. I don't know any Claudios. I don't care for the Italians. And I'm sure you knew his grandfather, Maurizio. Maurizio Vedetti, like I said, he died the same day as David Myers. We need to know what happened that day, Esther. I won't rest until you tell me, but I know you want to. How can you live with a secret like that? And when you tell me, I'll make sure you're safe. Safe and free. Free? You know what they did to David Myers, don't you, Esther? She pushes herself to the window and she stands, leans on her armchair, 
and she sits herself down, looking at her small segment of world. Frank can understand that even if you can only see a little of the physical world, you can travel through other people's words and through your own memories and imagination. In Esther's case, that's a well-ploughed field. A well-ploughed field, is that a cliché? It's time to leave, Esther, he says. He was the love of my life, you know. David Myers. It's time to tell the world what happened, isn't it? He deserves his story to be told. 34. Louis Considine sits cross-legged in a litter of greased Dixie chicken wrappers and bones and two-litre plastic bottles of ice white, one of which has been fashioned into a bong. He nurses his head, and Curtis Considine kneels beside him. Can't we just have a minute together? He's my little brother, for God's sake. I'm sorry, Curtis, says Staff. We need to talk about Layla and Margate, the day Jadis was shot. Staff goes down on his haunches. Was Brandon behind it all, Louis? If you bear witness to that, we will keep you safe. I promise you. Curtis says, Don't say anything, Louis. Brandon's not here. Louis looks around, his eyes wild and red, black bags beneath them. His cheeks are sunken and his teeth yellow. He looks more like forty than fifteen. Some wires got crossed, says Curtis. Where did Layla go? I want her, as like you said it to be, Kurt. She's so perfect, you know, man. We've got her, says Staff. Louis looks at Staff, then back to his brother. He seems unsure who the answers are coming from. She's my girlfriend, man. You know that? Of course she is, says Curtis. Louis says to Staff, Who are you? You that copper from Sean's place? He looks at his bright-eyed brother, wanting a miracle. Curtis says, I'm on your side, right? We're brothers. You need her alibi, Louis, says Staff. You're in trouble without it. Well, she was with me, says Louis, staring at his brother. Now she's saying she was with Curtis when Jadis was shot. That puts you in the frame. Louis says to his brother, What's he mean? He shivers, rubs his hands up and down his arms like he's being crawled over by spiders. Staff says she's changed her statement to say she was with Curtis. No way! Why would she lie about that, says Staff. Curtis says, well, she lied before, right? Staff says, they were on the beach with champagne and oysters. Oysters? says Louis. He's shaking now and beads of sweat pop on his brow. They're an aphrodisiac, says Staff. I know what you're trying, says Curtis. What's he trying, says Louis. Where's Layla? I've got to see her. She's securing her liberty, says Staff. You should do the same. The fuck's that supposed to mean? Curtis kneels beside his brother. He's winding you up. Stay strong. We caught Layla in possession of ecstasy and MDMA, Louis, says Staff, standing up, backing away to the window, raising his voice. You do know she has an unspent, suspended sentence. She will do time for this charge we're holding her on. She's desperate, Louis. Desperate, he says to his brother. Where did she get the money for that gear, says Staff. Look at me, Louis, says Curtis. Did your student loan come through, Curtis, says Staff. Is she dealing for you? Are you speculating to accumulate? Is that part of the plan? 
Say nothing, says Curtis. Looks like the best laid plans can go awry. What's awry? says Louis, looking at staff, then back to his brother. It's in the shit, says Curtis. Like his man in jail, that's all he's trying to do, get his man off the hook, and he doesn't care how. Come clean, and maybe we can get Layla out of this. Say nothing, Lou. We can bring Layla back home. Just tell me and she'll be free. Louis scratches his arms, leaves long red tracks almost to the blood. He leans back and sweat coats his head and face with a dull sheen in the morning light. Louis reaches out behind a cushion and pulls out a bottle of Courvoisier. He takes a long glug. I leave that alone, Lou. Tell me, Louis. She'll be free, you say. You promise. I swear. She says she was with Kurt. I'm only fifteen, you know that, don't you? Louis, says Curtis, don't do this, man. It was me. Louis! I killed Jadus. He looks at Curtis. It was me, all right. Not Brandon, not anyone else. I'm only fifteen. You got that. He's high. He's high as the fucking moon. We'll see, says Staff, kneeling in front of Louis, taking the boy's head between his open palms. He waits for Louis's swimming, bloodshot eyes to assume some kind of focus. Are you absolutely sure about this, Louis? I knew it couldn't work. It's all right. He puts two fingers together, imitating the barrel of a gun, and presses them to Staff's heart. Brap! Brap! Two bullets! Right to the heart! He looks across to the window where his brother is standing, blocking the light. But Curtis has his back turned, looking out, past the gasometer, all the way across the Isle of Dogs, to the Naval College. Pennington's phone goes off, and he takes it, seeing it is staff. He listens to the good news about them tracking down Layla Franklin and the younger Considine confessing. He can imagine how keen his man is to rush to Pentonville and see his sergeant, tell him the good news. I told you not to get involved. I'll have to tell the commissioner that you ignored me. You ignored a direct order, not just from me, but from her. Staff tells him they got the truth. They found Jadis Golding's killer. We have a version of the truth, Will. You know that. It's as much as we can ever hope for. Staff starts apologising for dropping Pennington in it. He says he will personally explain to the commissioner. Shut up, man. What I'm telling you is to come into the station and to deliver Louis Considine into custody. He'll be questioned and held on remand. But this trial is going to happen. This is new evidence, is what it is, and we have to process it, and Pulford's prosecutors will need to be told. The CPS will evaluate the situation, but your work is done, you understand? Staff says he wants to be there when Pulford is released. We're a long way from that. Not everybody's going to be as pleased as you. Some people don't want this. Staff says he's going to Pentonville. You can try, but they won't let you in. Pennington chooses his words very carefully. I need Carmelo Trapani, Staff, and I need him today. I want it to be you delivering him, hear me? You bastard, well, hear me. Make sure it's you delivers him to me. Two uniformed officers lead Louis Considine away to the meat wagon, destined for Pentonville. Staff sits in Leadengate's reception, watching the new shift come in. 
His limbs are heavy and his eyes ache. But he knows if he tried to sleep, the anger wouldn't allow him. He can't believe they won't let him see Pulford. That Louis Considine's confession is simply added to the pile of evidence. Right now, a team from Internal Investigations is corroborating Louis' confession. They are treating it with suspicion. You need to get it together, Will, says John Ball, sitting beside him, slapping him on the thigh. You've heard the rumours about cuts. Well, I say bring it on, but they won't let me go. I'm too expensive to get rid of, this close to retirement. But watch out for yourself, Will. What are you saying? Staff has a flash vision of what life would be like without his job. It makes him feel afraid, alone. Rimmer's been hard at it, you know. While you've been on Pulford's case, he's brought in Attilio Trapani, and now he's found A.B. Meyer's wife. What? Interviewed her and got some evidence that the whole thing goes way back to A.B. Meyer's brother David and a fellow called Maurizio Vedetti. The bastard! Vedetti? Rimmer! I got all that stuff. Is he passing that off as his own work? He's uncovered the evidence. This Verdetti character was murdered on the day of the Cable Street riots. And he knew Carmelo and Aby. He was Maurice Green's grandfather, so they say. I discovered that, not Rimmer. Seems to me you've got to bring in Maurice Green. John Bohr hands him an envelope, dressed with Italian stamps, and stamped Sicilia. Staff stands, looks down at his old friend. You know, they won't even let me see Pulford. It stinks, Will, but you've got him the evidence he needed. You've just got to let it play out, trust in justice. They would let his mother in to see him. Can you get hold of her, John? Ask her to come down, tell her there's good news. Of course I will. And we got a call from City Royal. The shared database flashed up a name you might want to hear. Miles Hennigan. Well, thank God something's working. What did they do for him? He's still there, I think, with a laceration to the face. Lucky not to have had his eye out. Thirty-five. Miles Hennigan curses as he twists into the jacket of his suit. He's in a private side ward in City Royal, and the nurse tells him he's in no condition to leave. He has no choice, says Staff. Hennigan and the nurse turn around in concert. You need to make yourself scarce, don't you, Miles? Before A.B. Myers finds out where you are... Are you rumbled? Uh, would you mind if I had a couple of minutes with the inspector, nurse? When the nurse is gone, staff says, Tatiana called you the other day. Why would she do that when she is Morris's fiancée and Morris is harbouring Carmelo from A.B.? Is Morris harbouring Carmelo? He wants to be the one to reveal the secret, or not. I don't know what you're talking about. Secret. And A.B. desperately wants to keep it buried. You've lost me completely. Staff reaches out, puts his index finger to the patch on Harrigan's eye. Did A.B. do this? When he discovered you're a turncoat. I am a man of honour. Where would a man of honour look if he wanted to find Morris Green? Miles Hennigan sits on the edge of the bed and sighs. It's not what you think. What I think is that Morris lives in the past, is where he belongs. And Carmelo needs to face his past, to prepare his redemption. But I don't understand why Morris would protect Carmelo, if he played a part in the murder of his grandfather. Surely Morris wants revenge for Maurizio. Why not let Aby do his worst? Well, that's quite a theory. Maurizio Vedetti died on the day of the Battle of Cable Street. He was crushed to death, but nobody saw it happen. 
He died just two weeks after Carmelo and Jacobo Sartori landed in Tilbury from Sicily. And Carmelo wants redemption. How poetic. But what you have is a thirteen-line sonnet, Inspector. Hennigan smiles, enjoying the look of surprise on Staff's face. You mean something is missing? Do you know what it is? Hennigan shakes his head. Morris discovered something that freaked him out. It made him rethink everything. That's why your precious secret's not already out. He's unhinged. He did this to me. Staff takes out the photograph of Jacobo Sartori from the envelope stamped Sicilia. A mop of unruly curly hair and a broken Roman nose. A rugged beast of a man. Seen this before? Morris had the same one, says Miles, resigned. Staff turns the photograph over, shows Miles the reverse, where it says, Certified likeness of Jacobo Sartori. Milena Sartori, daughter. It is stamped Polizia Siracusa. Not the Jacobo Sartori you and I have come to know. And if that's not Jacobo, then Maurizio isn't Maurizio. I can't help you. You know how it is. Morris was going to save Carmelo. He wanted the truth to come out. Now I'm not so sure. At least tell me what state Carmelo is in. He's going to die. Soon. All the way from Luton, where she's staying with her sister, Maureen is up and down from her seat. To the loo and back. To the buffet car and back. Constantly to the luggage rack and back. Much as Maureen keeps herself busy, she can't stop the ebbs and flows of her heart. Just a couple of days ago, Maureen had learned that David would plead guilty, take his punishment, and in a few years he might get a generous parole. He always had his own way of doing things, especially after his father deserted them. It was her fault, of course. Then Sergeant Jombo had called her. As the train rattles into the thick-skinned city, she prays to St. Jude to thank him for saving her lost cause. After Sergeant Jombo had called, she got Ray to make inquiries, and he confirmed it is true that another boy had confessed to killing that man who had shot David's boss. Slowly, very slowly, with her sister holding her tight for an hour and more, she came to believe what these police were telling her. She knows it's the hope that kills you, though. The train begins to slow, and the vast King's Cross canopy makes the carriage go dark. She thinks what a fool she has been. If it's true, why isn't David released already? She had asked Ray, and he said the Crown has to consider the evidence. What's the Crown got to do with it? At this point she tried not to believe, but something in her heart sang. She tried to resist, but the hope had already risen. Everybody rushes to gather their things. They cram into each other, shuffling for the doors as if their lives depend on it. Maureen sits alone, until the man with the large bin bag comes to clear the newspapers and coffee cups. He tells her to move on, doing it with a kindly smile and a soft hand on her shoulder, as if he could possibly understand. Jacobo Sartori moves away from the window of his fine Edwardian villa. The window is etched with long-stemmed flowers, stained emerald and rose. Within sixty seconds, Jacobo is back, looking up and down the street. Before long, Apollina appears at his side. The two of them appear to be in some well-mannered disagreement, and Jacobo points up the street, in the direction of Muswell Hill Road. Five minutes later, the front door opens, and Apollina leaves the house, pulling a shopping bag behind her on wheels. Jacobo waves from the window, looking quite mournful. She waves back and looks equally sad. 
staff lowers his field glasses as she comes towards his parked Peugeot 406, battered and inconspicuous. He turns down the music, which is Bartok. It makes him think of Curtis Considine and Marco, two long lives ahead of them. Staff watches Apollina until she's completely out of sight and considered his next move. You are in a strange mood today, my boy, says Carmelo, sitting in the back of the car which has blacked-out windows. Morris locks the doors from the switch on the driver's door. Carmelo lights up a cigarette. Is this the day? He takes a drag as best he can, coughs until his eyes water. Those will kill you, uncle, and you don't want that. Are we finally done with all this prevaricating? The truth is what's killing me. Which truth? Morris keeps an eye on Carmelo in the rear view. The old man is looking out of the window, watching his adopted city scroll by. The truth? That it was A.B. Myers who killed your grandfather? that I completed the pact and ran David Myers through on Brighton Racetrack. It was straight after the third race. You can't corroborate. There is only one truth, Uncle. You can't give one to me and the police and keep another to yourself. I am coming clean, so why would I lie? Morris drives steady. Carmelo says, You drive slower than me. Like an old man, you should be fast at your age, eating life up. They say it is better to travel than to arrive, <laughs> just like an old man. But where are we travelling to? What is this fateful destination of mine? A police station? Not yet. Perhaps not at all. Unless you tell me the truth. I've told you the truth. Carmelo takes a deep drag on his cigarette and holds his side as he coughs up. Where are we going? These are the woods. Is this Muswell Hill? It's where you stashed Jacobo. Stashed? Oh, you've been a good boss. He lives like a successful man, perhaps the manager of a bank. Yet all he does is make your risotto and collect your laundry. It doesn't add up. He's a friend. But I've been adding up, Uncle. I wonder how I'll fare with my total. You talk in riddles. Carmelo sits back and remembers when he and Jacobo first came here, thinking they were champions of the world. Morris turns slowly without indicating into Cranley Gardens, and a horn blares from the angry driver behind. They paid cash for the house. Four hundred and fifty pounds. A fortune. Carmelo catches Morris looking at him in the rearview mirror. A smile creases across the young man's face. I never thanked you, uncle, for that share in your house. I appreciate it, and I think I understand it. There's nothing to understand. Me and Jacobo and Apollina sharing, not allowed to sell. We'd end up living there together, wouldn't we? It's big enough for an extended family. Extended family? What's that? Morris pulls up outside Jacobo's house. Carmelo says, This is too obvious a place for me to seek refuge. Refuge? We are simply taking our chances with the truth, and by coming here a swift resolution is assured. That's what you want, isn't it? I want to confess, damn you! Is that too much for a diamond to ask? What harm? <coughs> Carmelo coughs. What harm can come of that? Morris turns off the engine, twists in his seat to face Carmelo. 
Attilio rests heavy on my conscience. They arrested him for your abduction. We can't allow that. He doesn't care a jot for his own father. He can't fuck himself. He would see me die in sin just so he can cling on to his life as gentry. That's a lie, not a life. And they say he tried to kill himself. Well, that's the act of a coward and a sinner. My God, he deserves the truth to come out. Does anybody really want the truth? Oh, you want it, surely? You want justice for Maurizio, your poor grandfather? I want what is best for my grandfather after the life he has lived. That's the only thing that matters to me, absolutely the only thing. Carmelo tries to say something, but coughs again, holding his chest and leaning back. Staff keeps an eye on the black golf with tinted windows outside Jacobo's house. After a short while, Maurice Green steps out. He glides around the car, leaning into the back, helping someone out. For the first time in many long years, Staff sees Carmelo Trapani. His eyes are bright, but his face is grey. In his hand, a blooded handkerchief. Still, everything about the man exudes grandeur. He would draw the eye even if you weren't looking for him. Carmelo walks up Jacobo's path with his head high, his draped overcoat hanging from his shoulders in long folds, like a Benini, and Staff suddenly feels less capable of negotiating the conclusion he had in mind. At the door, Carmelo pauses and turns. He looks across the road and fixes his eyes on Staff's Peugeot. His long jowls crease almost into a smile. His chin comes up an inch or so, like a leader of men. He grimaces and holds his side, coughing, bringing the handkerchief to his mouth. The door opens, and Carmelo steps inside. Staff thinks, stick or twist. Jacobo brings Morris and Carmelo a tray of tea, with glasses of water and a bottle of aquavit, three tulip-shaped glasses from Morano. Will Apollina be gone long? says Carmelo. Until she hears from me, says Jacobo. Did she know we were coming? She knows me well enough, after everything I have denied her. You gave her plenty, Jacobo, says Carmelo. She was here when Morris called. I have never been able to lie to her. You just didn't tell her. That's the same as lying. Don't think you're better than me, Jacobo. And Morris called you to say we were coming? To what end, I wonder, says Carmelo, looking at Morris with some hostility. My only concern is Maurizio, uncle. I'm still unsure of the circumstances surrounding his murder. I told you, A.B. Myers killed him, and in return I did for David Myers, to my eternal shame and suffering. I need to hear Jacobo's version of events. He was my cousin, says Carmelo. And the important thing is, two men died. I must atone for what was done. Justice must be done. What would my grandfather think of what we are doing, Jacobo? What part did you play in the murder of that poor soul on Cable Street? Jacobo had nothing to gain, says Carmelo. Morris sits beside Jacobo on the sofa and taps him lightly on the knee with his open palm. His knee is all bone. Jacobo, a shadow of his master. Is that correct? Does my grandfather concur? Your grandfather? says Jacobo, his eyes big and wide in his kindly wrinkled face. 
Morris produces the photograph of the burly man with the dark hair and the broken Roman nose. He shows it to Jacobo, turning it over, showing the yellowed reverse with his name on it. What the hell is that? says Carmelo. Jacobo Satori, says Jacobo, reading the reverse of the photograph. He is watching over us, looking down, says Morris. But he is not Maurizio Vedetti, is he, Nonno? He's not your Nonno, says Carmelo. Morris turns to Jacobo, holds both his hands. What did he do to you, Nono? What did you do with your life and poor Apollina and my damned father? Claudio was damned, wasn't he, Nono? Even before he was born. That's why we had to send him away. And what of me? Am I damned? He turns to face Carmelo. What must I do to be absolved? I'll tell you what, uncle. I must save my grandfather from a prosecution of this awful truth. That's what I must do, even if that means sending you to hell. Thirty-six Maureen Pulford doesn't know where she is. These streets are a raggedy mix of the posh and the down at heel. Eventually they stop, and the driver growls, Twenty two, over the chanter of the black cab. She looks up at HMP Pentonville, grim and impenetrable. Twenty two quid seems an inordinate amount, considering it only looked a mile or so on the map. But Maureen picks five folded fivers from her purse and tells the driver to keep the change. He doesn't say thank you and gives her an untrusting smirk. He isn't guilty. Didn't do it, says Maureen. Sure he didn't, says the driver. He has an unkind face and Maureen wonders if that is what his job did to him. She steps out and when she sees the young mothers and girlfriends outside the visitor centre, her last whisper of hope loses itself in the noisy London air. Maureen looks at her boy on the other side of the glass, reinforced with wire, patterned like the exercise books he would bring home from school. He stands out from the crowd he is in now. He doesn't belong here. She realises that what she thinks is unchristian, and surely nobody is born to a life like this. But, looking across at the other inmates, she can just tell that some of them are equipped to survive in here. Not David. It's good of you to come, Mother. His voice is frail, and that makes her heart bump. It's wonderful news. They say they have a confession. Somebody else did it. I told you somebody else did it. But now they can prove it. You're getting out, David. The Crown is considering the evidence. You don't sound pleased. Am I a fool to get my hopes up? David tries to make the shape of a smile, but there's barely any life in his eyes. Of course not. Just that it might not happen in a hurry. Why not? If you didn't do it and someone else did and he says he did it, that means you didn't. Maureen watches her son's eyes as they settle into a gaze to the floor. They sit like that a while, neither speaking. She wants to hold him, but she can't. And she feels now, so surely in her heart, that if she did hold him, it would be for a last time. How can that be? Her voice breaks when she eventually says, What is it, David? I can bear anything, but don't lie to me. I was with him. I was with the boy who confessed. 
so I know he didn't do it. I was following him, hoping he would lead me somewhere. But he confessed. So we shouldn't get our hopes up. Not just yet. Call the inspector, for pity's sake, says Carmelo. I want to hear your confession first, uncle, says Morris. Tell me exactly what happened in 36. You know what happened. Some of the threads are loose. In real life, there isn't such a thing as a loose end. Everything happens for a perfect reason. Everybody acts according to their heads or their hearts, from strength or out of desperation. Life is perfect in that respect. Everything is explicable. Riddles! Riddles! You have your damned story! My grandfather, Morris looks at Jacobo, is Maurizio Vedetti, is he not? Of course. And he is here with us. Names mean nothing. What matters is what we do with the lives we are given. Finding a way to survive in the circumstances we are dealt. Jacobo and I have changed. We are different people. I was denied a family because of you. Your father's death was accidental. Your mother deserted you. You sent my father away as soon as he was born. You lied. The least you can do is tell me what happened that day on Cable Street. Morris turns to face his grandfather. Say it wasn't you who killed Jacobo Satori, grandfather. Carmelo says, For God's sake, let me tell my truth. What does it matter if we did for Jacobo Satori? We saved your grandfather. Two men were killed. The names don't matter. It matters that I am not alone in the world. I have lineage. And what about the family of this Jacobo Satori? Don't they deserve the truth about what happened to their husband, their father, their grandfather? Not everybody is like you, says Carmelo. And there's the pity, says Jacobo. He stands, goes to his grandson and embraces him. It was supposed to be me who they killed, Nipote. I did a terrible thing, that's why I had to leave Sicily. What did you do? I killed a man, the wrong man, and your Uncle Carmelo was sent from Sicily to do for me, but he couldn't. We played together as boys. I bullied him. Jacobo laughs, wipes his eyes. Then he met A.B. Myers, and they had this great idea. I ran David Myers through on the race course at Brighton. That's what I did, says Carmelo, short of breath. He clutches his chest and collapses into a chair. We told A.B. Myers exactly what this new Maurizio Verdetti looked like. Morris's grandfather taps the photograph of the tall beast of a man. And A.B. did a job on him, says Morris. Who was he, this Jacobo Satori? A fellow your uncle sailed into Tilbury with. Poor bastard, says Carmelo, wheezing. And you became my uncle's servant. Maurizio Vedetti had to disappear one way or the other. But you shipped my father back to Sicily. Why do that? says Morris. Jacobo says, Your grandmother wasn't fit to raise a child. Not then. You wouldn't believe the upset. I thought you met afterwards. She was a seamstress for Uncle Carmelo. We rewrote our history. You can't imagine how afraid we were of being caught out. We should never have sent your father away. But your grandmother was convinced we would be found out it was for his own safety. Believe me, there's not a day has passed. So, 
When Carmelo heard you were orphaned, we were so proud of you. We still are. Carmelo's manservant, Maurizio Verdetti, looks across kindly upon his old friend and saviour. He says to Morris, Grant your uncle Carmelo his peace. It is in your gift. Do that after everything he did for you. I have to think of you, Nonno. You are my flesh and blood. You plotted and played a part in the murder of Jacobo Satori. I can't allow that to come out. It was so long ago. There is no statute of limitations on murder here, Nonno. If I don't protect you, who will? When Layla Franklin has signed her statement and is released, it is Brandon Latimer who is waiting outside. It's true what he told her all those weeks ago, that he'd always be there for her if she did the right thing. She feels herself smile, for the first time in a long one. She gets into his big rig on the Farringdon Road, and they take a high-wheeled ride through the shiny city. And on the way, he starts fixing her up gently. He gives her a little GHB and smiles with her as he takes her down. He puts his hand on the top of her leg and gives her a soft and long squeeze. You got some benzos, Bran, she says, her eyes all dreamy and a little girl's smile smudging in her face. Brandon doesn't know how people can live like this, but, thank the Lord, they do. This is his client base. He's not deceiving himself. He's the businessman, and this is the consequence of his sales and distribution. The overriding truth is this. If Brandon didn't sell, he'd use. Economics isn't fair, but he looks at Layla and can see that he and she had an equality of opportunity, as Curtis calls it. He loves talking to Curtis. Together, they are above where they came from, and that's going to continue. It's what Curtis calls social mobility. Oh, man. He says, You got to be up for this little thing we need you to do, Lay. Then we can bring you all the way down. Hear what I'm saying, doll? He leans across, kisses her on the side of the mouth. How's I give you half a val? He sparks up a Dunhill International and holds the tar in the back of his throat. He'll have some armagnac when the sun goes down. It's superior to brandy, he thinks. Maybe a line of coke if it's just him and Jasmine and everything's quiet. But it's not quiet yet. Layla lies back, presses her head against the black tint, and she shifts in her seat so she's facing Brandon. Her little skirt rides up along her skinny white legs, and from his perspective, her thong doesn't quite do its job. Something in Brandon shifts. His libido is a constant threat. Gonna fix you up proper. Take your shopping. And then there's that something you can do for us all. Layla lifts her right leg and drapes it over his left. Brandon drives an automatic. It comes in handy every now and again. Can I do a little something for you now, Bran? This something is for Curtis, really. I have a bad feeling about Curtis if you don't do this thing. Curtis? He's all right, right? By the moment. But they got Louis in Pentonville. You got something more for me first, Bran? Sure. We needs to get you up and running. You want me to do that? He runs his hand, flexes his fingers. Layla gives him the biggest smile and lifts her top. Then you'll go into jail to see Louis. Louis? What's he to me? That's the point. He needs to do a right thing. I need you to give him a thing and tell him what's what. 
He can fuck himself. I got pulled in cause of him. He's gonna fuck himself, Lee. Brandon reaches into his pocket, pulls out a pill and puts it in her mouth. He holds on to it. Half, says Dr. Bran. He laughs, and she bites his fingers so he has to let go of the pill. She swallows it and sucks on Brandon's fingers. The Valium takes her down some more. Not enough to sleep any time soon. But she feels soft, and she drops her arm from across her breasts. Her smile spreads and becomes soft, lazy. Driving along Spitalfields, with all the shops open and the people cramming the pavements, and the jeep's tints keeping out the afternoon sun, Brandon checks his watch, goes with the flow. End of Disc 7 Disc 8 37 Layla feels a million dollars turning the heads of the other wags as she passes through Pentonville's visitor centre. The guard on reception pokes his tongue into his cheek when he sees her looking her up and down. Back in his rig, and when they were done, Brandon had given Layla a hundred quid of top shop vouchers and dropped her with Simone to cut her hair and do her nails at cuts. Had he given Layla cash, she would have blown it on booze and crack, of course. Every now and again, Layla catches a whiff of herself, and it gladdens her all the way through, until she realises what she's here to do. That makes her sad. But she reminds herself what Brandon said, and what she knew for herself too. Louis has brought this on himself, he really has. He's a casualty of war, and everyone in the game knows that score. In fact, when she thinks too much about it, like she's doing now, she's really annoyed with Louis. Like Brandon says, Curtis will be a prince of the city some day soon, and they will all benefit. But Louis could have ruined it for everyone, if it wasn't for Layla being a true soldier. This way, only Louis suffers. That's how it works. She feels pure, uncut, and she stops at the airlock doors, waits for the woman in front to go through. In the glass, Layla sees a faint image of herself. It is how she could have been under a different sign, and how she will be from now on. Sometimes she doesn't quite follow what Brandon says, and Curtis too, but she knows she likes the way she looks now. This is her new life. Layla puts her hand in her top, like she's doing her tits, but lifting the fat capsule and popping it under her tongue. Everyone knows Louis couldn't do his bird. He's too soft. It's best this way. The door slides open, and the woman officer pats Layla down. Layla thinks the officer might be copping a feel. That's how good she looks today. But she knows there can't be any kickoffs, so she doesn't even tell the woman to go fuck herself. Just touches the fat capsule with the tip of her tongue and keeps stum. The coating of the capsule is getting tacky. Brandon said it'll be good for ten minutes, but it doesn't seem that way, and she looks for Louis, wanting it done. He's over against the wall, and there's an officer right by him, so she sucks in her tummy and works on her roll, which is easy in these new heels. Louis looks right past her, though. He seems out of it already. His eyes are slow, like he's on something already. Taz, maybe, poor fucker. Lou, she says, just a metre away, and talking funny because of the capsule. Shit, what if she swallows it? What? He looks at her tits. They're gathered up nice and plumped with fillets. He looks up at her face. Lay, he says. His mouth drops open and he stares a while. You changed. Out of the corner of her eye, she can see the perv officer eyeing her up. You like? Don't know. You should. She sits down and leans across. I miss the taste of you, Lou. 
You are talking funny, Lay. Why are you talking that way? She leans across further, getting the capsule in the curl of her tongue. His face is big now, and his pores are all clogged with muck. His eyes are all pupil. She puts her hand on the back of his neck. We can't touch. I want you, Lou. Layla glances at the officer, and she smiles at her, watching. She raises her eyebrows, almost encouraging it, and Layla reaches under the table, puts her hand on Louis's crotch. He's wearing thin cotton jogging bottoms, and he's halfway hard already. She whispers, kissing him, putting her tongue into his mouth. Swallow? She says it like she has a speech impediment. But the pill is gone from her mouth now, and she pulls away, watches him moving his tongue around his mouth. She knows him, can tell he's thinking twice. You're all hard, Lou. I want to kiss you again. Want to kiss you hard, man. It'll make you better. What is it? It'll stop the hurt. You don't sound like you, Lay. I'm being the best I can. For you. I came for you, Lou. Swallow. So I can kiss you proper. He puts his lips tight together so the blood goes from them, and he closes his eyes. The lump in his throat goes up and then down. Done, she says. He nods. You trusted me. Course, he says, coming forward for his kiss. Oh, Lou. And she feels a lump in her own throat. Silly cow, she thinks, kissing him hard, but like he's someone else now. Thirty-eight. Louis looks around, doesn't know where he is. It's like a living room, but with too many books. DVDs and newspapers, too. He was in jail, and he doesn't remember getting out. He tries to stand up, but his legs aren't working, and his head feels too heavy for the muscles in his neck. His eyes close again, but someone says his name, and he blinks, and the man he sees is kind of familiar. The man touches him, and it feels funny, but that's because the man is wearing gloves. The thin rubber gloves that doctors wear. Come on, Lou. Stand up. Stand up, man. Who are you? The man is big and strong, and Louis can feel himself standing up. He tries to push the man away, but his arms are too heavy. And now there's something touching his neck, something tight around his neck. The man is making big circles in the air, wrapping this thing around his neck, and Louis tries to ask him who he is and what he's doing, but he can't get his mouth to move. He can't summon the air to send the words out. He tries to breathe through his nose, but it's too tight, and now his throat hurts. His Adam's apple is being crushed, and he feels as though his head will burst. His face is tight, and the blood is pressing up at the surface of his skin. He blinks his eyes, and they feel as though they're bulging, and now they're wide open, he can't close them again. It hurts behind his eyes and in his temples. The man's nose is snotty, and he says something, but Louis can't hear the words, but he can feel the draught of the air that carries the words, can smell foul meat in the man's breath. Louis realises that the man is crying, like a baby. He tries to ask the man to help him, but the words turn to dust somewhere between his chest and his head. And then he feels himself fall, and the pain in his throat is white hot. It's dark now, and silent, apart from a distant sound of water slowly rising within him. Soon even this recedes and Louis makes a final attempt to gasp in some air. But he feels his jaw lock, and then there is nothing. The 
the door to the house of the man formerly known as Jacobo Sartori opens. For a few long moments, nobody emerges. Staff slides down in his car seat, keenly watching the house and looking in the wing mirrors and up ahead. The street is empty, and Jacobo emerges, fair-haired and frail with his turned-up nose sniffing for trouble. Of the triumvirate of survivors, he is the best on his feet, and looks nothing like his age. Staff has a glance at the photograph of the real, brutish Jacobo, and mutters, Hello, Maurizio, watching Maurizio Verdetti walk down the path. When Maurizio gets to the gate, he turns, waves up to the house, and his grandson Morris emerges, pushing a wheelchair. Carmelo is all wrapped up. But as Morris eases him down the step, his head lolls forward. He is unconscious, and Maurizio scuttles back up the path and tends his friend and cousin and saviour. Together, Maurizio and Morris push Carmelo down the path, and seeing them this way, side by side, Staff can't believe that he didn't identify the likeness of grandfather and grandson earlier. The fair complexion, the small turned-up nose, their angular, narrow-shouldered frames. When they get to the car and begin laying Carmelo down on the back seat, Staff sees his moment for intervention, so he gently closes the car door behind him and crosses the street. Maurizio is the first to see him, and he looks afraid. When Staff gets within five yards, he says, Hello, Maurizio. Jacobo? says Maurizio. Let's not pretend, says Staff. Morris looks up, says, You should go inside, Nono. I'll deal with the inspector. I'll call an ambulance, says Staff. There's no time, says Morris. We'll follow you. No way, says Staff. We need to get him there now. He's dying. Isn't that what you want? When Carmelo dies, his secret dies. I don't care about his secret, says Morris. Even if it means your grandfather will be exposed as a fraud. Morris gets in the car. You follow me. I'm taking him to City Royal. They know him there. How can I trust you? He's dying, Inspector. All he wants is to survive long enough to give you his confession. After all these years, it's what we all want. In the back, Carmelo's eyes flicker open, and he seems to be trying to say something. His eyes plead, and he tries to talk, a thick thread of blood trickling out of the corner of his mouth. Maurice Green starts up the engine, and Staff runs back to his car follows Morris's black VW down the steep road, London laid out like a blanket below. Morris drives fast, overtaking and undertaking and going through ambers. Staff goes through on the reds and stays within one car or two all the way down the Holloway Road. As they approach Highbury, Staff's phone rings, and he ignores it because Morris seems to be taking it up a notch, driving on the wrong side of the road to get past a line of buses. The phone goes again as Morris goes through a red light and staff downshifts. Sees both calls are from Jombo. Horns blare and he misses a drop-topped TR7 by less than a foot, swerving towards the oncoming traffic and just about making it back, two cars behind Morris again and almost on the new North Road. He clicks callback and talks hands-free, asking Jombo what he wants. Staff can tell from the way John Bob pauses before answering that it's not good news. Come on, John, what is it? Louis Considine is dead, Will. What? Suicide. A white van pulls out, and a bus comes the other way as the middle of the road disappears to nothing. Shit! shouts Staff, breaking as hard as he can. The pad's squealing, and his back end flicks out as the ABS judders, and he's in a skid, pressing the horn hard as he can, still sliding, slowly, coming to a halt just inches from the bus. 
on the pavement, a young mother with a pram shakes a fist at him. You okay, Will? says Jumbo. He's got nowhere to go, and he can just see the black VW turning left up Essex Road, going east, not south towards City Royal. Staff gives John Boy the registration of Maurice Green's VW and tries to get his head around just how Louis Considine's suicide will affect Pulford's situation. As he drives slowly on, he begins to feel dreadfully sad that Louis thought he had no other way. And he also realises that he must find Carmelo Trapani, hear his confession for the murder of David Myers before he dies. He knows that Morris won't go to his flat or to Carmelo's house. He has an idea that they could use the room in the King's Hotel in Brighton. Maurizio had the room key after all. Or, if the plan is to nurse Carmelo to his death so he cannot confess, Morris might be in cahoots with A.B. Myers. Certainly there is a mutuality of interest there now, especially if Morris is acting to ensure the liberty of his grandfather. Staff calls John Bohr and asks him to contact Brighton CID and to also check A.B. Myers' two houses. An ambulance tears past him, on its way to Pentonville Prison, and staff pulls in, a hundred yards shy of the jail. He imagines what despair Louis Considine must have felt, how lost his soul might be now. And that makes him think of Vanya Livorsky and her faith, and Carmelo's preoccupation with St. Peter. He gets out of the car and looks up to the heavens, realising what he must do. Maurice Green pulls the blanket up to his uncle's chin. Carmelo sleeps again now, but he had recovered consciousness once since they came here and Maurice gave him some morphine. He told him that he wouldn't be confessing to the police and that those old crimes would remain unsolved, there being no evidence without his statement. At this, the old man had wailed and begged. Morris had said he was going to get a priest, and did he know this diocese? Carmelo had pleaded with his nephew to bring him his own priest. As he pleaded, he spat blood, and Morris's heart relented. Morris looks back a final time before he leaves to speak to Father Penetti. Staff waits for Vanya Livorsky to return with the information. He has baby Gustav on his knee, and the young boy runs his pudgy hand across Staff's stubble, chortling to himself with bubbles of saliva popping in his mouth. The infant throws back his head and claps his hands together. So funny is this ticklishness on the man's face. He likes you, says Vanya, coming back in. She kneels in front of her alabaster crucifix and figurine and lights another candle. Staff offers Gustav to her. In a moment, you hold him while we pray. Come on, join me. We shall pray for Carmelo's soul, and then you can have your precious information. When they're done, Vanya takes baby Gustav from Staff in exchange for a piece of paper. He says... This is the only way I can think of to save him. It's the only way I can find him. And if I don't, as I've told you before, he will die alone. They will let him die. He reads the name Father Penetti and the address. Vanya says, Are you a father, Inspector? No, he says. You should be. You would make a good one. And you are full of love, I can see that. You shouldn't try to cover it up. Love is no use if you are alone. You must love God, of course. But he wants more for us than that. Staff kisses Gustav on the top of his head and leaves, checking the address, knowing he doesn't have a moment to waste if he's to catch Father Panetti before he's called away. Staff watches the priest press the bell of the grand house in Canterbury, a three-storey affair at the end of a lane by the New River Walk. Maurice Green lets him in, and staff calls for backup. 
tells John Bo it is urgent and not to let Rimmer get wind of it. Earlier, he had raced around to the Church of Our Lady Bernadette in de Beauvoir, just in time to see Father Panetti leave the chaplaincy, clearly in a hurry. Panetti had walked briskly up North Church Road and across Essex Road. He'd paused briefly on the New River Walk to make a call from his mobile, and after that had prayed, crossing himself, before walking slowly up to the house. From here, it seems you might be able to leave the house from the rear, and when he looks at the map on his phone, staff sees the garden leads back round towards Essex Road. The fences are prohibitively high, and he hopes the backup will arrive in time. In the dark room on the top floor, Father Panetti chastises Morris Green for not taking his uncle to hospital. He kneels beside Carmelo and traces the cross with his thumb on Carmelo's forehead. Carmelo blinks, and Morris takes two steps backwards. I, you, police, says Carmelo, his voice brittle and thin. It is Father Panetti, says the priest and I am here to pave your way to St. Peter, like we talked about, Filio. Can't you bring the police? says Carmelo. Forget it, uncle, says Morris. You should take him to a hospital. And you should administer what God pays you to do, says Morris. Know your place, father, and save my uncle's soul. He can't, says Carmelo. I must confess to the police. Have pity, father. Carmelo musters what life he can. He knows he can't take any more morphine. He's no fool. My hands are tied, filio, says Father Panetti. But mine aren't, comes a voice from the dim entrance. Morris turns. Sees staff and walks quickly towards him, pulling a flick knife from his waistband. The steel fizzes as the blade releases, and staff stands to one side. In the hall, two uniformed officers in body armour flex into defensive positions. Please, says Father Panetti. Thank God, says Carmelo, his voice cracking. He raises his arm limply and beckons staff to him. Morris takes a step towards his uncle. Staff shouts, Don't, Morris! Morris says to his uncle, Please, uncle, think of Maurizio. Think of him and his life and what you owe to me. You sent my father away. You ruined him. Let Maurizio enjoy his last days in peace without the shame. They could prosecute him still. I must tell the truth, Filio, says Carmelo. Think of Maurizio in this life, not yourself in the next. This is for us all in the next. We must do the right thing, no matter how late. Staff comes to Carmelo holds out a dictaphone as Carmelo begins to relate the events of the 4th of October, 1936. And as he does, in the background, in words from another land, Father Panetti speaks the sacraments. As Carmelo tells his story, so Father Panetti concludes, and with the viaticum still warm on his lips, Carmelo's hand slips from his chest. Thirty nine. Rimmer and Pennington stand shoulder to shoulder, each regarding the front page of the news. A picture of Carmelo Trapani dominates. It was taken in the sixties and shows him sharp as a knife in a suit and fedora. Now he is laid out in front of the two police, a pale and withered shadow of the man in the picture, all wired up to nutrients and antibiotics. Is very decent of you, Frank, says Pennington, letting staff interview Esther Myers. Rimmer nods earnestly, trying not to smile, but inside he is overwhelmingly happy. We're a team. 
And we should all be there when we get A.B. Myers. We have enough evidence to convict him for the murder of Jacobo Sartori. We need to reverse Esther's sectioning. The Crown is keen, but only if we can absolutely prove beyond reasonable doubt. So you need Maurizio Verdetti to testify. If he doesn't, we'll prosecute him for accessory and deception. Once we get Esther Myers under oath, she will do the right thing. David Myers was the love of her life. Abe's brother. It was years later, when Esther discovered what happened to David, that she supposedly went insane. Aby had plenty of influence, so it was no problem to put her away. And we have the recording of Carmelo's statement, too. Nice work by staff. I wonder how much quicker we might have solved this one, sir, had staff not been distracted. Pennington puts a hand on Rimmer's shoulder blade, squeezes until Rimmer grimaces. Your old man would be proud. Let's keep it that way. Staff runs up the Farringdon Road, checking his heart rate on the wrist device that Josie bought for him. He's ticking over at more than 150, which should be his maximum. His T-shirt is drenched and his shins have started splinting, but he's in range of Leadengate now. He stops and leans against the craggy flint wall of St. Bart's Church, waiting for the reading to tick down to 139. When it does, he kicks on for a final interval. He wonders how long it will be before they can secure Pulford's release, and how he will fare when he's back on road. Will he even come back into the fold, given the way he's been treated? There's every chance he'll face a disciplinary, too, for his treatment of Jasmine Cash. And what of Louis Considine? He didn't have it in him to take his own life, surely. Staff puts on a final spurt, the sweat pouring down his forehead and into his eyes. The salt stings and his heart burns. He checks the monitor as it clicks from 159 to 160, and he slows, jogging into the Leaden Gate car park. He leans on the bonnet of his battered Peugeot, just a few yards away from the clutch of internal investigations officers, sucking on cigarettes and untroubled by the rigours of the real world. Staff bends double, gulping for air. He can hear them laughing about something, probably him, but his thoughts have snagged. He can't stop thinking about Louis Considine. The head of internal investigations comes over. It's us supposed to punish you, staff, not yourself. Very funny. Just trying to extend my life. So are we, but you don't seem to listen. Well, you should be pleased we got a confession from Jadis Golding's killer. Surely you wouldn't want to see the wrong man convicted for the sake of a little police work. You are aware the words can be used together. Police. Work. Now who's being funny? It's not fucking funny. You'd have seen Pulford sent down just because it suited the police to be seen to be addressing themselves. Can you imagine... <sighs> Staff slumps onto his haunches and clasps his chest. You are right. Imagine Pulford... He struggles for air. Shooting a man? Twice in his heart? Staff recalls what Louis Considine had said and done when he confessed. Two fingers on Staff's chest. Brap! Brap! It wasn't the heart, says the man from Internal Investigations. It was the stomach, says Staff. We need to speak to you about precisely how you came to get that confession out of Louis Considine. If there's any hint of coercion... Oh, you'd love that, wouldn't you? Says Staff, standing, feeling light in the head. Come on! We need to talk. All he can think of is what Louis Considine said. Brap, brap, two bullets straight to the heart. It was the stomach, wasn't it? Says Staff, 
seeing Josie coming down Cloth Fair, and before she clocks him, he discerns a look of quiet despair in her eyes, and he feels a yearning to save her from that. In this moment he wants to go to her and wrap his arms around her. Are you listening to me? says the man from Internal Investigations. He waves to Josie, and her eyes brighten as he walks towards her. You're running again. He wiggles the device on his wrist. Within strict parameters. He takes hold of her arm. It is warm and soft, nutty brown still from the summer. If those guys from Internal ask where I've gone, say I'm going to see Nick Absalom at the news. Josie says softly, You scare me. I have to go. He moves off, his hands sliding along her arm. Briefly they hold hands, and he hears a shout. He breaks into a jog, looking at Josie now, seeing a new angle of her jaw, the flow of her hair and the sun catching. The men from Internal Investigations call after him as he runs between the slow-moving cars and buses, then down the steps from the viaduct and up to Ludgate. He's in a good cadence now, running in the gutter, between the traffic and the pedestrians, his thoughts synchronising with the rhythm of his stride. His heart is smooth, and the truth comes, in glimpses and phrases. 40. The whites of Mako's arm and eyes are pink, and a clump of tissue juts from the tight fist of her right hand. The computer screen shows the news front page. According to Nick Absalom's live feed, Louis Considine committed suicide whilst on remand at Pentonville, and as a result his confession is in aspic. Absalom speculates this might suit the police. Staff knows otherwise. Where is Curtis? I don't know. Mako bows her head, and the computer screen lapses to a screensaver of Curtis and Mako at the seaside. They're drinking champagne and are poised to swallow oysters, but he can tell from the aspect of the shore that this is not Margate. Staff moves the mouse and goes into settings, sees the machine is programmed to time out after five minutes. Curtis searched for this article. He's here. He takes a deep breath, sniffs the air and leans back, raises his voice. I can stay all day if I have to. Mako looks at the ground. She is afraid. The door to the bathroom creaks and Curtis enters, closing the door behind him. It's a hell of a price to pay says Staff, nodding at the computer's breaking news. Curtis can barely speak. One by one, the syllables utter like cracking toffee. That is my brother. He slumps onto a beanbag by the window, puts his head in his hands, and when Mako goes to him, he shrugs her away. Into his hands, he says, I want to be alone. Staff leans on the windowsill, blocking the light. You have to explain what Louis said. That's your job. Staff feels his skin bristle. The device on his wrist shows 115, far too high for a resting pulse. My job is to select the truth from what people tell me. He didn't know it, but Louis told me the truth when he said he shot Jadis. He shouldn't have, says Curtis. He said he pumped two bullets into his chest. That's a lie. What? But it led to the truth. Staff goes down on his haunches. You killed Jadis, so Louis didn't have to. That's a brave thing to do, isn't it? Fuck you! But you let Louis admit it. When it came to it, the coward in you is just too big, isn't it? A phone sounds. It's dull, coming through the door to the bedroom. 
All three of them look around. The phone stops ringing. What's that? says Staff, standing. Is someone there? He calls out, Come out! Mako scuttles to the door, hissing at Staff. Leave him alone! He's a done nothing! I'll call you, says Curtis as she leaves. And as that door closes, so the bedroom door opens, its frame filled by a Brandon Latimer. In one hand he holds a bottle of red wine, patting it against the open palm of his other. The tempo is steady, and Brandon doesn't blink. He seems to have it all worked out. Says, You've been warned, time enough, Inspector. What makes you think you have the right? This is a step too far. Intruding on my friend's grief like this. I know who killed Jadis. And so do I. They're saying poor Louis was driven to take his own life, but me and you know that's not so. That poor boy didn't have the strength to do that. He was helped along the way by your man inside. You're the one with people on the inside, Brandon. From what I hear, your man didn't cover his tracks so well. Staff says, there's only one reason Louis would lie about killing Jadis. You'll scare the living shit out of him. That poor boy had no life without his big brother. That's how you raised him, am I right, Curtis? You know shit, says Curtis. You've no right being here, says Brandon, taking a step towards staff. You didn't even announce yourself when you came in. Your man Pulford and now you have been harassing us for months now. We're all pent up. Brandon grabs Curtis by the hair on his temple. Stand up, man! Curtis yelps and grimaces, but he stands up. Brandon thrusts the bottle into Curtis's hand. I saw it. As God is my witness, I saw what happened, and so did Marco. I came in as it was happening. The G.A. knows you were already here. Don't you worry about the G.A. The G.A. knows what's what. Brandon whispers into Curtis's ear, and the fear crashes down into his eyes. He takes a tighter clench on the neck of the bottle. Don't do it, Curtis. I know it was a gangland execution and you were coerced. You did it so your little brother didn't have to. What the fuck you talking about? Curtis here was by the beach with a friend, says Brandon. Louis was only fifteen. That was the plan, right? Just in case you couldn't pin it on Pulford. But you just couldn't let him do it, am I right, Curtis? When it mattered... Your heart prevailed over that amazing mind of yours. Do it, Kurt, says Brandon. Curtis Considine's eyes glaze. He says, you should have left him alone. He did nothing wrong, but you kept coming for him. Curtis takes a step towards Star, who raises his hands, anticipating the blow. But Curtis is young and strong and the bottle comes down hard and cracks the bone in his forearm, and Staff falls back into the window. The window smashes, and he hears it tear his jacket and skin, jagging into his arm with a flash of pain. He's leaning out of the window. The breeze is warm. Curtis steps forward again. Push him out, shouts Brandon. The pain from the cracked bone in his forearm shoots up one side of Staff's body, and the jagging cut sears through the other. His heart stops as Curtis comes towards him, reaching for his neck. He tries to defend himself, but his muscles are limp, his energy ebbing away. Curtis smashes the bottle against the frame of the window, and the wine sprays red. Curtis grips him tight and is pushing him now. 
He sees the sky. Pigeons flap way up, and the broken neck of the bottle comes at him, and he raises a hand. Staff hears a crash, and thinks it must be him going all the way through the window. And then he sees Curtis's eyes go even wider. Brandon shouts, Fuck! And there's another crashing sound, and Curtis releases his grip, and Staff falls. He falls away from Curtis, and he knows this is it. He waits to feel the air beneath him, and to maybe twist and see the ground, then feel the impact, the crunch of bones. But something holds him, pulls him back, and he feels flesh on his face and arms around him, and someone familiar whispers his name. They say, Staff, soft and gentle, and they press their lips to his face, and finally he knows who it is. Josie, he says letting her hold him, surrendering as she lowers him gently to the floor, where he sits in the broken glass, and the wine and his own blood thicker, redder. He looks up at her. She kneels beside him and puts her hand to his cheek and says, You fool! Over her shoulder, he sees six men in body armour wrestling Curtis Considine and Brandon Latimer to the floor. Latimer is advising them of his version of his rights, as Rimmer reads them aloud. How did you know? he says to Josie. She holds his wrist, taps the device. Tracker? It was Rimmer's idea. She leans close to him, whispers, He's not what he seems. Staff breathes in her scent feels his body go loose, and he surrenders as she holds him tight, her cheek pressed into his. Forty-one The doctor peers over his pince-nez glasses and snips the thread to the last of the eighteen stitches he has just put in Staff's arm. He takes hold of the wrist of the other arm, and Staff bites his lip. We need to get this in a pot. Can it wait an hour, says Staff. He turns to Josie. We've got to get to Pentonville and make sure Pulford knows we've got Curtis Considine all stitched up. There's a car waiting outside, sir, says Josie. I'll go and see Pulford. You stay here and get yourself sorted. You look a wreck. I'm coming, says Staff. And somebody's going to have to get hold of that E-gang member in there. What's he called? Salmon? They call him Beef. I'll call the governor. Staff tries to pull on his shirt, but he can't bend his arm. Josie helps him, and the sleeves flap, where the doctor had to cut them open to dress the wound, then stitch him up. On the way out, Staff sees Rimmer waiting by a coffee machine, talking to a nurse. He goes across, says, Thanks, Frank. It was good of you, I suppose, to keep track. Beyond the call. My old man used to say nothing was beyond the call. He ever say that to you? Staff nods. Well, it was a brave and decent thing to do. You look like you need a few nights in here. I've got to see Pulford. They won't let you in, but I could come with you. I know the guys on reception up there. They're okay. Thanks, Frank. I'd appreciate that. Let me do the talking, hey? This once. Josie joins them, says, I can't get through to the governor, and the phone on the wing won't pick up. Rimmer looks at his watch. It's recreation. The smell of 600 men is something you can't escape. You can isolate 600 hard and desperate men from society. You can even separate them from each other. But even through concrete and steel, a collective will prevails. Never in his long weeks here in Pentonville has Pulford sensed such menace. So he tried to stay in his cell. 
But his psychologist said he had to socialise, and Crawshaw told him he'd be on another governor's if he didn't do as he was told. Going into a trial, that's something he can't afford. In the corners of the unit, men gather in twos and threes, and the talk of suicide spreads. Pulford waits to be let into his pad. Suicide, says his next door, a nation lad called Asif. Your boy, they reckon. I don't have a boy. His confession's your ticket out, pussy, says Asif. Pulford looks down, sees Beef coming up the stairs. He's wired, looking around for something, his eyes burning, and when he sees Pulford he mouths the words, Fuck you. Pulford calls to Crawshaw. You letting him in my pad or what? Asif says he tops himself just after he confessed your crime. Fuck, man, that's good for you. Mr. Crawshaw, shouts Pulford, let me in. Now Crawshaw comes along the landing, swinging his keys on a chain from his thick leather belt. He catches them expertly and in one sweep puts the key to the lock, opens Pulford's door and ushers Pulford in, but Beef appears before Pulford can close the door, and Pulford glimpses a new expression on Crawshaw's face. It is humane. He looks afraid, and he wonders what hold Beef and his gang must have over the P.O. You can't touch me, says Pulford, looking Beef in the eye. Something smells. A new smell of rubber. It smells like Durex and Pulford watches as Beef pulls out a pair of thin, flesh-coloured rubber gloves. Put these on, says Beef, offering Pulford the gloves. Why? You don't need to know why. Pulford shakes his head. Louis didn't kill Jadis. Well, you should fucking know. But he's dead now, and he can't take his confession back, can he? That suits you, right? That's reason enough for you to shut him up proper. Beef tosses the gloves onto Pulford's bed and takes out a small brown bottle with capsules in it. He puts it under the mattress on the top bunk. What are they? Beef reaches behind him, delves into his pants, brings out a paring knife, and points at the gloves. Put the fucking gloves on. Pulford realises why Beef wants him to wear the gloves, why the pills are under his mattress. Pulling the gloves on, he keeps his eyes on the sharp blade of Beef's paring knife. He looks quickly up at Beef, sees his eyes are dead. He seems to be on the very edge. Pulford says... Louis was a good boy, you know. He never harmed anyone. It's a shame he didn't have his brother's brains. The fuck you know about Curtis? Curtis? Says Pulford, feeling something click. He has the second glove in his hand now, stretching it. We can be better than this. Can't be better than what I'm dealt, says Beef. Pulford grips the middle finger of the glove and stretches the rubber, aiming it at Beef's eye. He lets go of the glove with his left hand and the ribbed elastic of the wristband pings into Beef's eye. Fuck! he says, holding his eye, dropping the knife. Pulford stoops, reaches for the knife, but Beef lashes out with his foot, catching Pulford on the jaw. The bone cracks but he clasps the knife tight, lunging out and thrusting the blade into Beef's thigh. The blade goes fizz as it cuts through flesh and tissue and squelches as he pulls it out. Beef raises his hands, half martial arts, half boxer, his grey sweat bottoms turning instantly maroon as the blood flows. Pulford takes a step back. You better mean this, man! Beef steps towards Pulford, who backs away. A key rattles in the door. You're going to have to kill me to stop me! 
The door opens, and Crawshaw shouts, Drop the fucking knife, Pulford! Beef says, My man cut your fucking dog up with a knife, just like that. Beef steps forward, pulling back to punch Pulford, who raises his hands, jabbing out with his left, holding the knife back, and he takes a blow to the head and falls back against the wall. But he pushes himself off, and Beef keeps coming, and Crawshaw keeps shouting, and Beef is all over Pulford now, with his throat in both hands, staring wide-eyed into Pulford, whispering with rank breath, Do it, pussy! Do it! And as the air backs up into his lungs, and his throat screams with pain, Pulford tries desperately to stop himself jabbing out with a knife. He can only hear the drumming of blood inside his own head now, and his hands are wet, cloying. He puts the knife to Beef's throat, and watches as the point of the steel presses into the flesh. Enough! Crawshaw is standing in the door. Pulford looks at him, sees the same fear in the P.O.'s face that he saw before. Do it! hisses Beef. Pulford looks down into Beef's eyes, sees no fear. It is almost as if Beef has seen into what lies on the other side and knows he can take it. Do it, he whispers. Pulford grips the handle of the knife even firmer and closes his eyes. He pictures what they must have done to his dog, his mother's sadness. He thinks of the sacrifices his mother made and what she would say to him if she was here now. Do it, implores Beef. Pulford thinks about what he still wants from life, everything that could lie ahead in here and beyond. Slowly, he opens his eyes. Slowly, his grip on the knife relents and he rolls away. Here's the knife fall to the floor and Crawshaw rushes across, twists him. The traffic is slow as ever on City Road, but up ahead the thick three lanes begin to separate, making way for a flashing emergency vehicle coming up behind, siren blaring. And Staff shouts to the cabbie, Get in its slipstream! Follow it, man! They chase the ambulance all the way up to the prison, and Staff's heart sinks when it turns right up to the prison gates. He, Josie and Rimmer watch as the driver barks into his radio, gesticulating at the POs on the gate to open up, let them in. Do you think it's anything to do with Pulford? says Rimmer. I'll ask at the gate, says Josie. I'll come with you, says Rimmer. Staff watches them go, but his heart is so heavy already. He fears the worst for Pulford, so close to making it out. Slowly, Rimmer and Josie make their way back from the gate. Her head is bowed. His face is grim. It's Pulford, says Staff. Isn't it? I'm sorry, sir, says Josie, not looking him in the face. The gates glide open and the ambulance goes through, high revving and clearly a matter of life and death. Is Pulford in there? Levi Salmon has been assaulted. It was in Pulford's cell. Behind them, screaming up onto the prison forecourt, a police car screeches to a halt. The uniformed men run up to the prison gates and they are let through straight away. What the hell can we do now? says Josie. We make the Curtis Considine conviction stick, says Rimmer. It's not looking good for Pulford, though. They won't let him back into the force if he assaulted Levi Salmon, says Staff. Maybe that's not what he wants, says Josie. You saved him. Remember that. You found Curtis Considine. He'll be all right. Let me take it from here, Will, says Rimmer. It calls for a cold heart. Staff smiles. A cool head, Frank. Standing, he says to Josie, Keep me posted. Every step of the way. You're going to stand back. I know the score. 
Pulford needs all the help he can get, and I am probably bad news right now. On the corner he pauses, looks back at Josie and their eyes lock. Remmer has turned away, talking into his phone, and Staff raises a finger to his lips, winks at her. Remmer seems to have found a couple of new gears during the course of this case, and Staff wonders if that will put his own future in jeopardy. He feels sick and empty, deep in the pit of his stomach as he contemplates his future. But a part of that emptiness is wanting to be with her. Can it be so? Forty-two. Josie keeps half an eye on Rimmer, who is busy on the phone, talking to Margate CID, who are questioning the man with the cockle van down there, showing him scanned photos of Louis Considine and Layla Franklin. Rimmer spins slowly in his seat, and she gets to work on the interviews at the LSE and down on the lime kiln. When she's done, Josie calls HMP Pentonville and is told that DS David Pulford is being held in isolation on a zero-contact regime for his own safety. The prison is, belatedly, arranging for all known members of the E-Gang to be relocated. As for the trial, an application to defer has been made by the Crown, and it is expected that charges against Pulford will be dropped. She leans back, exhausted, and asks Rimmer if he wants to go out for a coffee. He's not there. She stands up, calls, Boss? and asks around, receives only shrugs as to where D.I. Rimmer has gone. One of the WPCs says, I heard him being super licky. Must have been onto a knob. Pennington, says Josie. Maybe my guess is higher. Josie scoots along the corridor and up the stairs, dialing staff's number as she goes. When she gets to Pennington's office, a uniformed minion sits on a chair in the corridor. Is D.I. Rimmer in there? she asks. Can't say, says the young graduate, looking her up and down, adjusting the fall of his hair. Just tell me, you prick. Potty mouth. Staff answers, and she whispers, I think Rimmer's in with Pennington, sir. And Beverly Strong. That can't be good. It's best if you don't... But the line is dead and her phone beeps like a flat line. Staff knocks and goes in, ignoring the pleas of both Josie and the pink-cheeked graduate sitting erect outside DCI Pennington's office. I'm sorry to interrupt, sir, says Staff. Pennington stares at the ground, seemingly defeated. He lets Beverly Strong speak on his behalf. You're a little premature, but... She looks at Frank Rimmer, who smiles. We were nearly done. Rimmer and Strong seem thick as thieves, with Pennington somehow on the outside. I was congratulating Frank on the Trapani case, says Beverly Strong. Bringing in A.B. Meyer's wife was terrific police work, just terrific. Without her evidence, the Crown was loath to push ahead and convict Myers. Staff recalls the conversations about budgets and cuts, glimpses of barren future, long, empty days. Tracing it all the way back to Cable Street, says Strong. Your father will be so proud. Staff tries to work out how to tell her that he, not Rimmer, made the connection to Cable Street. How to say it without coming across like an arrogant prick. But just as he is about to speak, Rimmer says... D.I. Wagstaff's liaison with the Sicilian authorities was key, ma'am. Beverly Strong beams at Rimmer. It's a wonderful story and so timely. Staff realises he has to fight his corner. Says, And to think you thought it was Attilio who abducted Carmelo. Beverly Strong looks disdainfully at Staff. Says, It doesn't completely distract from the events at Pentonville but we shall see what we can do to mitigate. Tell him, says Pennington. Tell me what? You will have read about the cuts 
says Beverly Strong. You know how tight things are, and we have to justify every single position. The bar is rising higher and higher, and now more than ever, oh, for pity's sake! Pennington stands up and walks to his beloved window, looks out towards the gherkin with Docklands beyond, the estuary that the Thames cuts all the way to sea. Beverly Strong, Rimmer, and Staff all look at Pennington, and he speaks softly as if to himself, Every dog has his day. He turns, looks at Staff. I'm sorry, Will. Uh, that's all right, sir. I know you have no choice. Pennington shakes his head. It's me. What? says Staff. Beverly Strong says, Congratulations, adieu. You have a new DCI. Beverly Strong extends her arm like a magician's assistant, but no frills, no curtsy. Detective Chief Inspector Rimmer. Like old times. Staff looks at Pennington, who seems dead behind the eyes. He shakes Rimmer by the hand with his good one, the wrong one. Then he goes to Pennington, wraps his stitched and plastered arms around him as best he can. Pennington whispers in his ear, You'd think, after all these years, I'd know what a friend looks like, wouldn't you? He grips Staff hard and says, Promise me you'll start making life easier for yourself, eh, Will? And easier for him? They both look at Rimmer, who doesn't know what the hell they're saying. No way. The two friends unclasp, and Staff leaves the room without a backward glance, but thinking how he never thought of Pennington as a friend before. He left it too late. Outside, Josie leans against the wall next to the ruddy-cheeked minion, and Staff remembers Pulford's first days. He says, If you're done with your cradle-snatching, Chancellor, maybe you'd help an old man across the road? I could murder a pint. She says to the young copper, Cradle, now there's something for you to aspire to. And she hooks her arm through Staff's, says, I guess you'll tell me what happened in there in your own time. Maybe it's a bad dream. Let's see if a drink might break it. They walk down the back stairs and she says, They haven't got rid of you, have they, sir? Worse than that. As they get to the bottom of the stairs, she pauses, says, This drink, can it be us? You know, just us, not the job. I'd like that. He steps towards her, places one hand on her shoulder, the other on the side of her face. He leans towards her, and each closes their eyes, losing themselves in a long, passionate kiss. They unclasp and smile at each other, glassy-eyed. He opens the door into reception, lets Josie go through, and he breathes in the scent of her. As she unhooks her arm from his, their fingers touch and trail, and he dreams how this might pan out. Watching her go ahead, he enjoys the shape she makes, the waft of her hair, the smile that just seeing her brings to John Boar's face. Then she turns, her eyes wide, and something broken in the outline of her smile. Beside her, Sylvie. I had to see you, Will, says Sylvie, flopping onto the sofa in his Queen's Terrace living room. It seems strangely normal. If I don't see you, it's not going to happen, is it? He knows every blade of her, and she him. Yet here he is, in the drawing room they shared together so often, tiptoeing around the matter in hand. The sun is low, just clipping the roofs in Launceston Square. It washes in through the twelve-pane windows and makes her golden. Her hair is in a long bob, and her skin is still perfect. 
Soon she will be thirty-four. He is unsure he is quite ready for this. He tidies up a pile of broadsheets. The flat is untidy, smells musty. He's barely been here other than to sleep since before he went to Spain. Come here, Will. Sylvie pats the sofa beside her. You are okay with this, she says, hooking her feet under her bottom as he sits. Her arm presses against the pot of his broken arm. Put the papers down. He does a rough sum on how many times they've been here and beyond. It was usually his place, not hers. A few hotels and cottages, but seldom hers. Either way, it's a lot. Laid out end to end. You want a drink? he asks. No. Ah, sorry. Stupid of me. Shall I put some music on? You could do with a massage. We could start there. He is strangely alarmed by her use of the word start, and now it occurs to him that this might not work straight off. I've had tests, Will. My eggs are good. <laughs> no pressure, then, he laughs, tensing up. She leans across, says, You are made of good stuff. He's a lucky chap. He, or she, does it matter? Sylvie kneels up and twists him round, so he's facing away, looking out of the window. They face the same direction, looking up towards the square with its black filigree balconies. Her fingers work on his buttons, and she peels his shirt away, gets to work on his bare shoulders, getting her thumbs into the taut sinew of him. You are tight as a drum. He feels her breath on his back. She smells the way she ever smelled, of soap and citrus. She never did sweat. Always tasted fresh. Fine. Sylvie places the palm of her left hand under his chin and works the knuckles of her right slowly up and down along his spine, explaining that all humans zip from the skull to the bottom. A good spine is essential. He has a good spine, she says, making him tingle, and he begins to loosen as her hands make wider and wider circles, and the gusts of her breath become more protracted, heavier. He feels himself unzipping, wishes he knew the rules. Sylvie slides her hands up over his chest, and she says, Mmm, turning him, her eyes closed and her mouth just a little open. You got me, Will. You always got me. He kisses her, and she hitches her skirt, takes his good hand, and puts it on her. There is no underwear, and she takes him in hand, guiding him. I... he says. Yes? Her eyes open, and she looks afraid. Her eyes are big, and he is transported all the way back to the first time he saw her this way. Him opening his eyes in their first kiss. When he misses her most, this is what he sees. I... What is it, Will? Her fingers press into his flesh, and he's on the very brink of her. I don't love you. She closes her eyes, opens them again slowly. Me too. She smiles. So, that's all right. Kill and Tell A D.I. Staff Investigation By Adam Creed Read by Jonathan Oliver Thank you for listening to this unabridged Oak Hill audiobook. If you'd like to listen to further titles, please contact your local library.